And so we are almost finished in this teaching series that we've been in since the beginning of January called Renewal, Reawakening, and Revival. And so as a new church in the city, it's really important that uh, obviously as we're building relationships, we're also building shared spiritual practices together as a community. And so, you know, when we look at the life of Jesus, before he begins his public ministry, he actually goes into 40 days of prayer and fasting. And so that's what we are trying to do as a church following Jesus' example. What is the one thing that Jesus' disciples asked Jesus to teach them? It was how to pray. And so for the last several weeks, we've been unpacking the Lord's prayer. And I think often sometimes, you know, if we've been following Jesus for any amount of time, sometimes uh, we trick ourselves into thinking that uh, prayer is the thing that we do before the real work, before doing ministry, where in reality, prayer is the work. Prayer is the source of all of our strength, all of our guidance, and all of our plans. And so, so far, we've unpacked the first four petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread on earth as it is in heaven. And so in the Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the first four books of the New Testament, the Lord's Prayer is only found in two of them. It's only found in Matthew, which is where Teresa read our teaching text today, and it's also found in the Gospel of Luke. And so there's a bit of a variation in terms of uh, the intentionality and context between, these, between the Lord's Prayer found in both Gospels. In Luke's Gospel, um, the author, which is Luke, he's writing to people that are completely new to their faith. He's writing to people, uh, the people group of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles is just another word for those that weren't Jewish, so they had no paradigm or idea how to pray. And so he's kind of teaching people how to pray, essentially, kind of like the basics. And in Matthew, Matthew, who wrote Matthew, very fitting, he named it after himself, right? Um, Matthew is teaching people that already knew how to pray. He was writing to the Jewish people. But he's teaching them and actually correcting them in the ways that they did pray. And so a bit of context to why there are two versions of uh, the Lord's Prayer. And again, just because they're found in two of the Gospels doesn't mean that Jesus taught this twice. Um, throughout his three years of public ministry before the cross, he probably taught this prayer very often and very frequently. So just a bit more review before we jump into today's petition. So the Lord's Prayer consists of a total of six petitions. Um, the first three petitions are centered around the pronoun uh, your, and the back half, petitions four to six, are centered in the pronoun us. And at the center of the Lord's Prayer, we see this prepositional phrase, on earth as it is in heaven. Again, I'm not like a grammar teacher, but a prepositional phrase locates things. Um, so in the sense of my iPad is next to me. Um, the sound house is beside 33 acres. And so what this prepositional phrase does right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer is it locates God's heavenly realities in our earthly dimension. And so this prepositional phrase actually applies to all of the petitions, which is why I mentioned on earth as it is in heaven as I was reviewing the petitions we've gone through so far. We've also learned that these petitions are not requests, but they are commands because they are uh, said and written in the imperative mood. What is the imperative mood, you might ask? The imper imperatives are commands. Um, so for example, when we pray uh, the, the fourth petition, which we you know, unpacked last week, we're not saying, can you give us our daily bread? We're saying, give us this day our daily bread. They're not requests, they are commands. And so lastly, the verbs in petitions one to three, because they're centered in the pronoun your, so it's uh, corresponding with a vertical relationship, our relationship with the Lord. Um, although they are powerful verbs in the imperative mood, um, they are also in the passive form. So instead of saying, make your name holy, we're saying, your name is already holy. The passive voice uh, gives us space uh, to approach the Lord with the reverence that is needed when we're talking to our Heavenly Father. So we get into today's petition. Um, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What's really interesting about this particular petition out of all of the petitions is Jesus actually further unpacks this petition after he finishes teaching this prayer. And so in verses 14 and 15, literally following our teaching text, um, Jesus says this, 
For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So why does this petition need extra context? Why does Jesus feel like he needs to further unpack this petition? I think because maybe for this fifth petition, it's the only petition that is interconnected with other people. What do I mean by that? This this fifth petition directly connects our relationship with God to our relationships with those around us. Um, I, I, I often think about this petition in the way how, you know, when we sneeze, uh, the automatic kind of reflex and reaction is to close our eyes. Like they're both connected. Unless you're part of like the 1% population that can sneeze with, without blinking. I don't know if that's impressive or really scary, um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, our relationship with the Lord is connected to others in this petition. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so in the same way, we cannot ask to receive forgiveness from the Lord if we are not able to extend forgiveness to others. So let's get into the Greek of this petition. So again, as a reminder, the New Testament was originally written in ancient Greek. And so the Greek word that Jesus uses here for the word debt is the, is the Greek word ophelima. Ophelima. I made sure to pronounce this before today because last week I, I, I butchered the previous Greek words. Ophelima. The word ophelima is actually not even a religious word to begin with. It actually has its roots um, in like uh, business and trade um, in, in the ancient first century context. Uh, and so ophelima, the rudimentary definition um, would infer a financial debt that is owed. It's almost like a, a business transactional word, ophelema. It is a uh, financial debt that is owed. But in this context, as Jesus is using this, as he's teaching this petition, it also refers to any social or moral obligation that is owed. There is something that is owed and therefore is due. Um, and so... You know, when we think about, you know, payments that is due, this is kind of the connotation that uh, Jesus is trying to teach. It is a payment that is due, there is a deadline, and therefore must be paid. It's like your mortgage, or your rent, or your tuition, or your Crunchyroll subscription, whatever you need to pay, because that is really important and it has a deadline, it must be paid. And so the Greek word that Jesus uses for the word forgiveness is the word aphiami, 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 which also has roots in the world of commerce. And so this word aphiami at its root means uh, to cancel, to wipe the slate clean in other terms, to cancel, to nullify, to wipe the slate clean, no strings attached, aphiami. It is the action of completely like wiping out the ledger. There is nothing left. It's been paid for. There is no longer any debt. There is nothing due. It is wiped clean. No strings attached. A theme. And so, if we were to pray back this petition with all of this context, it would sound something along the lines of this. <coughs> Father in heaven... Cancel what is owed from us due to our negligence, our mistakes, and our failures to you and to those around me. I think it's hard sometimes to, to understand this concept of like canceling and nullifying because even today, you know, when we think of like cost of living and just how much it costs to be alive today, nothing is free. Nothing just gets canceled. I feel like one of the only things like in, in the rise of inflation that has stayed the same is the hot dog combo at Costco. For whatever reason, it's still $1.50. I don't want to question it. I feel like there might be something going on behind the scenes, but other otherwise, praise God for that. You know, you get your drink, you get your hot dog. I don't think there's fries, but that's in a while since I've, yeah, no fries. Hot dog, it's enough. You get free condiments, so praise God for Costco. Anyways, Jesus uses the same language and imagery in his teaching and conversation with with Peter, uh, as he talks about forgiveness. Um, and so in this specific situation, uh, in Matthew 18, 21, 22, 
uh, prior to this conversation with Peter as he's kind of unpacking forgiveness. He's, he's explaining how to have a crucial conversation with a fellow brother or sister in Christ who maybe they're, they're living in sin or there's some type of conflict rooted in sin. But regardless, Jesus is kind of talking about this aspect in forgiveness in relation to having kind of these crucial conversations. And so in light of you know, what we're talking about, Peter asks this following question. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 77 times. Have you ever wondered why Jesus says 77 times? Do you think that because um, we have like a quantified number that, you know, once we reach the 77th time, we don't have to forgive people anymore? Um, that is not the case. And so uh, there, uh, he used to be a prophet regent, but he's been a local pastor for years. His name is Gerald Johnson. Um, and in his book, 57 Words That Changed the World, uh, by the way, one of the most helpful books in my study for unpacking the petition, so I would recommend to order this on Prime. Very good book. Um, but he kind of unpacks the, the significance of even the number 77. He says this, Because of what a man named Lamech once said, Lamech, great, great, great grandson of Cain, the firstborn child of Adam and Eve, had been wounded in some way by a young boy. In Genesis chapter 4, Lamech sings a song that ends, If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. The number 7 and 77 on the lips of Peter and Jesus speak of the reversal of the natural human tendency towards resentment and revenge. A reversal which Jesus has come to effect in the human soul. And so in this moment, like, Jesus is almost like playing like the reverse card right now. And he's giving new meaning to the, to the number and to the phrase 77. It's not so much, again, the number, but he's, he's almost like implying it doesn't even matter. And so what he's doing is he is completely renewing and redefining this, this concept that people probably would have said a lot of times, like, you know, 77, I'm going to uh, 77-fold, like, inflict this on my enemy or my neighbor, etc. And so, you know... To kind of parallel that to today, it's like if we were to redefine the term cancel culture to mean a culture of forgiveness. That's kind of like the radical nature of what Jesus is saying by redefining even this phrase of forgiving someone 77 times. And so Cain's great, great, great grandson Lamech is, he's boasting about his revenge using this term, this number 77. And so what Jesus does, he redeems this phrase to apply not to revenge, but to apply to forgiveness. And so what Jesus is essentially teaching, he's teaching us as followers of Jesus to embody and perpetuate a culture of forgiveness to others, to those around us, and to the world. And so in a sense, he's redefining what, uh, you know, again, what, what I mentioned, like redefining, if we were to redefine cancel culture to maybe like cancellation culture, cancellation of debts, cancellation of sins against us, mm -hmm. to perpetuate a culture of forgiveness. And so if we are to claim the central blessing to ask our Father in heaven to forgive us our sins and forgive us our debts, it only makes sense if we also live by the central blessing to others. But that's the tension and issue with our human nature. It's not easy to forgive, right? We, we, it's very almost natural to, to harbor bitterness and to kind of like, you know, we, we forgive, but we don't forget. You know, it's so easy for us to take that stance and that posture. And Jesus, knowing that about our human nature, he goes on after explaining this to Peter. He shares this parable. A parable is just, again, another word, just maybe for story about the merciless servant. So here's what Jesus says. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. 
But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. How often do we as followers of Jesus live as this merciless servant without knowing? We come to the Lord and we ask him to forgive us our sin and to forgive us our debt. But we turn around after the prayer and we're still harboring bitterness and resentment to those who have wronged us, whether it be directly or indirectly. If we are not willing uh, to forgive others and we pray this petition, um, in reality, we're not actually asking God to forgive us. If we're still harboring bitterness and resentment while we're praying this petition for God to forgive us our sin, in, in reality, we're only asking God to pardon us or excuse us, not actually to, to forgive us because we're still holding on to all this resentment and bitterness. When we pray this prayer, like I mentioned, there both aspects of this petition is connected to one another. It's like the sneeze, right? Again, if you're part of that 1% that can, can open your eyes, if you can do that, I will, I will buy you a coffee because that's very scary and impressive. But anyways, that's besides the point. Um, but they're connected. And I think that's why that word as is also in there. Um, the word as connects these two Actions. We cannot have one without the other. Again, when we're praying this prayer, it's like we have to think that, you know, even in financial terms, these are the words that Jesus is using in the Greek. There's this connotation um, even to the business world. And so when we come to the Lord and we pray this petition, we're asking, Lord, will you forgive us of the mortgage that we have, the mortgage of sin? But when we choose not to forgive others, we're going to those around us and shaking them down, maybe for $30 of sin against us. It doesn't make sense. And so, as I said, these two are connected. Jesus teaches us to pray this petition, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. We can't expect mercy and grace if we cannot extend mercy and grace to others. And and here's the thing. When we choose um, uh, to withhold forgiveness from others, The person that suffers the most is not the other person. It's you. When we withhold forgiveness from people and we choose to carry and harbor bitterness and resentment, we are the ones that suffer the most, not the person that's wronged us. Um, The late theologian Lewis Smead says this, To forgive is to set the prisoner free. Isn't that good? To forgive is to set the prisoner free and discover that the prisoner is you. If the practice of repentance to begin with already is tough to do, it's probably an indication that there is something in your spirit that isn't right with God. Um, You know, when I think about forgiveness, I think a familiar story for people that uh, have followed Jesus or been part of church communities, a familiar story is the parable of the prodigal son. Um, and there was even a line in one of the songs like talking about the prodigal. And when we read this story, and in a moment I'll read it to refresh our memory, but when we read this story, it's really, really easy for us to kind of put ourselves in the perspective um, as the prodigal son. You know, when we read stories, often, again, our human nature, we just automatically assume the protagonist position, where in reality, I think for many of us as Christians, we're actually that older brother in this story. And so allow me to to reread this parable for us. The parable of the lost son. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, 
I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About that time, his money ran out. And a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him any food. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. And when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on on." On everything you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. It's really easy to read this story and just assume that we are the prodigal son. Or in actuality, most times we are the older sibling. You know, when we look at this story, the fact that the older brother refuses to join the celebration, he refuses to physically come into the building, refuses to sit down around the table and share in this celebration. And last week, as we talked about uh, Give Us This Day or Daily Bread, we unpacked the importance of, of feast and banquet imagery. And so the fact that um, he chooses not to share a meal with his brother was the most disrespectful thing that he could have chosen to do. And I don't know if you've noticed, but in the narrative that we just read, the older brother not once addresses his dad as father. He actually, as we read the story, he actually identifies as a slave. Um, he says, all these years, I've, I've slaved for you. And so now he's He's almost like forgotten his identity as a son. Even when he acknowledges his brother, he doesn't even refer to him as his own family. He says, this son of yours, he is distancing himself from his brother, his father, as much as he can do. Because all of a sudden, he is in his mind, he doesn't believe uh, he's a son any longer. He's harboring all of this bitterness. He doesn't even see himself as a son anymore. And so it's very revealing of his heart. We see that his heart has become calloused, it has become cold, and it has become bitter. But as Jesus teaches us this petition, when we choose to forgive, it breaks the chains of bitterness. When we choose to forgive, it puts us on a path of freedom and reconciliation. And again, as that theologian Louis Sneed says, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner is you. The path of forgiveness is not easy and it's quite long. But as followers of Jesus, we have to keep in mind that we have been, we have been forgiven of so much. And so we are called to also forgive of so much. 
as sons and daughters of the living God, we are called to embody and perpetuate a culture of forgiveness, a cancellation culture of debts and sin against us. Because Jesus first loved us. Therefore, we are called to love others. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. 